The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Ready? Okay. Right, welcome everyone to MySQL High Availability. Uh, this is a disclaimer slide that we, we like to include from Oracle to make sure you understand that everything I'm about to talk about can be found on our websites. And if anything comes up that I talk about that is not on our website, it's as a result of uh, Oracle's discretion to release or not release. My name is Chuck Bell. I am the speaker today. I am also the team lead for MySQL Utilities team. The MySQL Utilities team is set up to deliver command line utilities for managing MySQL databases. MySQL Utilities itself is part of the MySQL Workbench tool, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in some later slides. I am also experienced with backup, connectors, replication, and of course, utilities. With more than eight years now of MySQL development, working in various areas of cloud computing, replication, and so on. And there's some of these shameful plugs about the books that I've wrote. I'd be wonderful if you were to buy those. MySQL High Availability is, of course, the presentation that this, uh, the book that this presentation is based on. I'm going to talk about a little bit of what is high availability and why would you care, and then talk about the MySQL High Availability get into some of the details of the, the features that make MySQL high available, including replication, and a little bit about cluster and some additional offerings that Oracle provides later on. How many people here use MySQL? Yeah, good, good, good. How about replication? Are you looking, are you using it actively? Good, good. Uh, looking to build uh, high availability solutions, or you already have solutions? Yeah, OK, great, all right. Uh, then you probably know this definition then. This is, a, is kind of a common definition. What is high availability? Well, it's simply put, it's an expectation. The expectation that your systems are usable and that expectation should be m measurable by performance and accessibility. And typically it's a, an expectation that's agreed upon in advance. So if you set up a high availability solution, you should already know by the vendor's claims and nothing else, how available that high availability solution is. And of course, we want to minimize the maintenance because what good would a high availability solution be if you had to take it down once a week for 10 hours? Uh, so why should I care? These are corollaries to the four points above. Your data is always available when you need it. It's, it's where you expect to find it. That's very uh, interesting. Some, some high availability solutions I've seen actually move the data around for you. And, uh, Sometimes it can be confusing where actually the data is. Uh, your applications themselves should experience very little, if no, downtime uh, having to do with maintenance and whatnot. And more importantly, your systems should be able to grow to meet your computational or data needs. So that's basically what high availability is and why you should care about it. MySQL provides a number of high availability features. We have a new version, MySQL 5.6, coming out very soon. Right now, it's in what we call a development milestone release, DMR. And that is available for download if you'd like to try it out. It's available on our download site. So it's dev.mysql.com slash download. You'll be able to get the DMR there. It focused on a lot of areas. Some of the top three are performance, scalability, and the NODB storage engine. So there's lots of improvements for that. And I'll go into some more details. There are also improvements in replication in 5.6. So you can remove a lot of the duplication of your data among your servers. So you, you implement replication to remove that duplication. Uh, I'm sorry, to improve the duplication to improve uh, read access primarily. And I'll go so, through some scenarios of how you can improve read access as well as write access. And of course, MySQL utilities, and I mentioned we have a number of command line utilities for managing MySQL, and there are a couple of very important ones for managing MySQL replication. I'll show you examples of all those. And lastly, MySQL cluster, which we have a talk right after 
this? No, no, we already had, yes, right after this, about my, uh, I'm sorry. Hey? Okay, good. So if you looked at that, that'd be great. Uh, if not, we've got a guy in the back here who could answer all your questions. Greg can answer your questions about MySQL cluster, but I'll have some slides on that as well. So MySQL 5.6, it is a better MySQL. Again, it builds on 5.5 release, which had a lot of performance improvements, but we have even more now. We've uh, increased the performance of the optimizer dramatically, so major effort on making the optimizer faster. We have a performance schema, which is a set of views, not unlike in information schema, which is a set of views that you can use to get some rather low level performance information about the server. So you can instrument your, your applications a little better. Or if you wanted to use it in a development environment, you could do that as well. And in LDB, we're fo focusing on transactional throughput to make things a lot faster in that respect. And of course, we also have emphasis on a NoSQL API, especially for the cluster, cluster product. And replication, again, there are a lot of improvements with replication, and I'll go through a number of those in this. And as I mentioned earlier, MySQL 5.6 DMR is available on the download site, and there's a a URL at the bottom for you. And it is GPL, so uh, you can download it. Yes, sir. I don't know, but it is, since it is DMR, it is, it's, it's, it, it, it is inevitable. It will become soon. <laughs> so, so yeah, 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 that slide at the beginning, yeah. yeah. But we're coming. So let's talk about 5.6 replication features and benefits. In the DMR, for performance for replication, we have multi-threaded slaves. Traditionally, in MySQL replication, the slave itself is executing one entry in the binary law that it gets from the master at a time. So one at a time, it reads one at a time. If you've got a master that's throwing tens of thousands of entries in a log and the slave is reading those, it's still executing them one at a time. With multi-threaded slaves, it allows us to divide that and conquer it. And right now, it uses a fairly simple division by database. So it can create a thread basically per database. So uh, that's not gonna help you if you only have one database and you're replicating massive amount of data, okay? But if you're replicating lots of databases, you will see a dramatic improvement. We also have a uh, focus on row-based replication, optimized row-based replication. And the deal is to only replicate what you need to replicate. So instead of replicating the whole change row, for example, they replicate only part of it. In the failover and recovery area, we have global transaction identifiers, which gives just what it sounds, a UUID to each transaction. So each transaction that occurs in your replication topology will get a unique identifier. This allows you to determine whether that transaction has executed on any server in the topology. So on any slave, you can tell right away whether that particular transaction has occurred or not. And that is very handy when it comes to complicated topologies like circular replication and, and of course, applies with um, failover as well. I mentioned some utilities. We have a replication failover and administration utility. And with 5.6, the DMR, and the MySQL failover utility, you can set up automatic failover for your topologies. And I'll go into that a little bit more as well. For data integrity, we have replication event checksums. So that makes sure that the event as it arrives on the slave is, hasn't you know, been through an error process where it's generated a flipped bit or something like that. So there's an extra data integrity. On the development side, we have, of course, replication utilities, time-delayed replication. We've had a number of people ask for that. And that's where, when an event occurs on the master, so a write goes to the master, and you want to actually wait until a certain time expires before that occurs on the slaves. Um, some, some examples of that might be you want to validate or vet or run another process to capture whatever that change is, or there is a long process that has to occur before that change gets replicated to your slaves. Time delay replication allows you to do all sorts of things with that. Remote bin, lo bin log backup, um, that's coming. I, I don't have a slide on that, but if you need more information about that, see, the, see me afterwards. 
along with informational log events, events you can actually put in the binary log to make searching the binary log a little easier, and server UUIDs. People who use replication, you gotta worry with that server ID, right? Yeah, that's a could be a pain if you if you're setting up a lot of servers and you have to remember, oh, I gotta increase that by one. Well, UUIDs will eliminate that for you. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Yes, sir. Yes. Right. Well, what's interesting about that kind of situation is uh, what you're talking about is a replication preheater. We we have ongoing discussions about that about how to do that. If you think about a generalized solution, which Oracle would be most interested in. Uh, developing, you have to consider what the events are and what they're actually doing. Typically, a, a, a replication preheater will say, if I'm doing no updates, no data updates on the master, so a write is coming in that's not changing data, when it goes to the slave, don't flush its query cache, leave the query in it. Or another technique is where, where you have a major set of writes coming through, tell the slave to execute this query, even though no one's asked for it yet, to make sure that the results are in cache. What we have to determine is how best to solve that. And there are a lot of solutions out there right now, and they're growing. So it is something we are, we are thinking about. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We want to do it uh, correctly. <laughs> and correctly means uh, the most effective way for the most largest generalization of the users. But yes, so very good question, by the way. Uh, so why MySQL replication? Those who don't use MySQL replication, these slides are for you. MySQL replication duplicates the databases from your master, so from one slave that you designate as your master, to a number of slaves, a number of servers that you designate as your slaves. It creates a redundant copy, if you will, of all the data. And this allows you to achieve high availability if you split your writes and your reads. So you send all your writes to your master, so the data is only updated in one place. And then your applications would read from the slaves. So it allows uh, all the more complicated operations, writing, changing data, to occur on one server. And then the less complicated, faster operations occur on many servers. And this is very nice because it allows you to scale out across a large number of slaves. Uh, so here's a workflow. And I have some more slides that talk about this. When uh, a change comes into the master, you'll start from the left-hand side and work right, that, that change is written to the binary log. Once it's written to the binary log, each slave that requests a dump of that log and it's only by request of the slave, that gets transmitted to the slave, which then would read that information, write it to its relay log, read it from there, and execute it. So that is the, the workflow of replication. So each, each one of these things, a session is a thread. There are one or more dump threads, one for each slave. That on each slave, there is one I.O. thread and one SQL thread. If you do a show slave status on your slave, you'll see the status of those threads. And similarly, you can get that information on the master by showing, showing the process list. So if you want to extend your replication topology, so you have more than one slave, you see it's simply a repeat of the right-hand side of that equation. So another slave, which means another dump thread, and that slave has its own threads to handle the, the execution of those events. So here's uh, another example. Uh, to take a little look at, at that example I gave earlier, where you have a replication implementation. You have your web server, your app servers, whatever that are actually part of this. And you have your master that can read and write information. 
and stores it on its binary log, and let's replicate it to a slave that stores it on its relay log. So there are two kinds of logs, binary log and a relay log. Format-wise, they're the same. So if there's one tool called the MySQL bin log that you can use to uh, get information about either one of those. You might be wondering, why doesn't the slave have a binary log? Well, you can if you use an option called log slave updates. It will actually turn its own binary log. So it will write to its binary log anything that comes in through replication. There are various reasons why you might want to use that. OK, as far as performance improvements, again, this is with the DMR. We have the multi-threaded slave. And as you can see from the example, it'll bring the transactions in, divide them by database, and execute them in parallel. So you might wonder what happens when I have a transaction that spans databases. Well, it's a little bit smart about that. It will actually look at the transaction to see what's going on um, and attempt to do them in parallel. But again, it's, it's not meant for someone who's got this massive database that it's replicating to a whole bunch of servers. It's meant for someone who has a multi-tenant or multiple applications, multiple databases that you want to replicate. That's where you'll get the most performance. So here's a, a kind of a breakdown of what we, you can expect. If you have a throughput, you set the multiple slave threads to zero, it turns multi-thread slave off. But you can set it up to 1024 threads. If you look at execute master log position in slow state status, it'll show the low watermark, in other words, what the lowest point is that's been executed. The way you configure multi-threaded slaves is use a slave parallel workers option and set it to whatever threads that you want. But that number should be set to the number of databases, typically, and no more. As you set it more, it's not going to help. Set it less, well, then, you know, then some of the threads are doing multiple things. So here's a, another uh, example of how on the master you have these various things coming in. They're, they're most likely coming in from multiple threads as well for each client that's attached to it. And they're color-coded. Does the color show up? Yeah, great. Color codes to give you an idea of different uh, threads. Then on slave one, you could see how it would take those things based on database and split them up. So DBA, or database A, would be one thread, database B another, and database C another, and so on. As far as performance goes, you can look as much as a five times higher performance using multi-threaded slaves. So if you set your worker threads somewhere around say 10, you, and depending, of course, on your database, you can see a considerable improvement in slave performance. And again, this is something that the uh, uh, industry has asked for for some time, and now we're finally delivering. So for row-based uh, performance improvements, we used to, before the, the uh, 5.6, when the, a change came through, what was written in the binary log is the full row image. So row is in result set row, not row is in query language tuple. It's, a, it's an actual row from the database. So you've got the before image and the after. And the stuff shaded in yellow is just, for instance, say only that part of the row changed. With the bin log row image set to minimal to optimize row-based replication, now you get the perform Im image with only the key and the after image with only those changes. So as you can see, there's a whole lot less data that's being passed around, particularly if your rows are very wide. So you have uh, you know, lots of columns or a lot of wide columns, for example. And then only the user would only change, say, a column that's an integer. Well, why transmit you know, 256 megabytes of row information when you only need to change uh, just an integer space. So that's what optimized row-based replication does. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, it'll keep the secondary indexes as well. We're, we're Absolutely. And, and the intention is that they, it would. Now, there are some... Yeah. Potentially, yes, potentially. But in this case, we're talking about the index that identifies the row. 
So if you have a secondary index that doesn't identify the row, then, then we won't worry about that. But notice that we need that index. So if you don't have any indexes on your table, uh, I haven't asked the developers directly, but I must assume that this doesn't work so, as well for tables that don't have any indexes at all. Uh, so your default, again, is to include both the full image uh, before and after. If you set the bin, bin log row image equal minimal, it will turn on this new feature. And again, it's only available in the DMR currently. Now let's talk about failover and recovery. Uh, these are two terms that basically mean what happens if your master is no longer available and how do I get it back? Global transaction identifiers are the answer. As I mentioned, you get a unique identifier for each transaction in your topology. So it originates on uh, the master via a client writing new data, changing data, whatever, what have you. That gets assigned a global uh, transaction ID, and then that gets replicated through the binary log, out through the dump thread, into the I.O. thread, to the relay log, and then processed by the SQL thread on the slate. You can now determine, given any topology and the slaves that are available, what transactions are in the topology in general. Uh, before you had global transaction IDs, since each slave, remember, are single threaded, if you had a bunch of transactions come through your topology, you, didn't, you don't really know on each slave, without doing some, some careful investigation, if it has all of the transactions executed or not. So what happens if you have a slave that didn't get the last 10 transactions, and another slave that got four of those, and, and there's yet another slave that has all of them? How do you know which one is up to date? Well, of course, there are ways to detecting that. Moreover, what happens in a situation that the master is no longer available now? How do you know which one of those slaves is the best slave to use? Global transaction identifiers will allow you to determine that. In fact, there is a process by which it, you, even if a master is completely gone, and your transactions have been dispersed such that no single slave has all of the transactions, you can actually get all the transactions that have been executed on your topology. So you can gather them up together and make, if you will, the latest or most up-to-date slave. So again, before global transaction IDs, you had written to the binary log on the master, read, and then transmitted to the slave. Your slaves could be in any position. And the way you track uh, how far a slave is behind right now, one way you could do it is by looking at its, the name of its master's binary log. So if the binary log is the same name, then you look at the position. So there are two, two things that you need, the binary log of the master and the position. Um, so in this case, in this example, we have no one of the slaves are actually up to date at all and they're not up to date with each other. So if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, that one's actually the furthest behind. And we only make that determination based on the name of the binary log. So if you name your binary log something funny, then you may not be able to track that too, too well. So if the master goes away, now how do you know which one to set it to? Well, again, you've picked the one with the highest uh, or the latest binary log with the, the highest position in the log, in which case it would be that top one there, most likely. Now with global transaction IDs, similar situation, when the master goes away, how do you know which one to choose? Well, the process is simple. Pick any slave, make it a slave of every other slave, and it will accumulate all of the transactions for you. No, no. During the process of failover, the master's gone away. You have no master. Then you choose one of the slaves, make it a slave of every other slave, and it will pull in all the transactions that it, that's not, that it doesn't have. Like yes, yeah, yeah. So that's part, part one of the step. And then that new, that slave that's been a slave of every other slave becomes the new master. Point all your other slaves to that one, 
And now you know you have all the transactions in the topology, regardless of where they were at the time. Is that cool or what? Yes, sir. Ah, that's the thing. MySQL failover will do that for you. So it's a self-healing, very low administration for replication topology. MySQL failover utility, and I have some more slides for this uh, a little bit later. That allows you to set it up. So MySQL failover utility runs once for each master in your topology. So if you have a multi-tiered topology, you'll want to run it for each master. So it looks at the master, and it, based on an interval, it says, are you still alive? Yes or no? If the answer is no, then it goes into that routine I just described to gather up the, all the transactions and promote a slave to the new master, and it switches it for you. It's pretty cool. Another utility that you could do on demand or when you want to, so if you don't use the automatic failover, MySQL failover, is RPL admin, MySQL RPL admin. It'll allow you to, on, on demand, in other words, do this now, switch over or failover. The difference between switch over and failover is in switch over, the master's still alive. So in this case, you have the opportunity to tell your applications to stop writing to the master, allow your slaves to catch up before you switch the role to one of your slaves. Uh, so in, that's the difference between switch over and failover. Failover, the master's gone away. You have no idea what, what was executing at the time, but you want to be able to get all the transactions that are in the topology at the time and take over from there. Yes, sir. Yeah. We have extension points in the utility that allow you to write your own scripts to do notification, uh, either application, email, and so on. So there are actual extension points that you can use to do that. Yeah, if you didn't put a script in there, you just have to look at the console again and, and tell. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Crest safe slaves. That's very difficult to say fast. That's another uh, improvement we have in the 5.6. And in this case, we're talking about automatic recovery of a slave and its bin log if it fails. So the bin log and its table data are transactionally consistent. Before this, your relay log, your binary log, the information about the master were all stored in files. Of course, the two logs were in their log files, but the master information was in a file too. If something happens such that, that one of those files gets corrupt, when you restart the slave, potentially you could have problems. So in this case, we put all those things in tables instead of files, and that way, particularly if you're using NLDB and, and fault tolerance thereof, you can get the information back much quicker. Now, so it allows you to resume replication without trying to go in and fix the logs and whatnot. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it will automatically come up. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty neat. Uh, and that's because it's stored in tables instead of files. And it sounds very simple, but it actually has a very profound effect. And the way you do that, uh, well, there's various ones. I'll show you a couple here. Uh, you can set the master info and relay log info to something, to tables. And the way you do that are those two options there. Master info repository equals table. And relay log info repository equals table. That sets up those two tables. If I'm in the MySQL database, one's called slave master info and slave relay log info. So it protects the information that the slave has to know what its master is. So uh, we should have a term for that. But when the slave goes wonky and it doesn't know what its master is, it can get lost. Now, why is that important? Well, if you have a very large installation with multiple applications, many different masters and slaves, if one of the slaves and a rack of, of 100 servers goes down and you have no way to know who its master was, how would you ever put it back online? You'd have to go in and actually mine the information and try to figure it out. Uh, so that's another reason why you might want to keep, uh, keep this in mind when the 5.6 comes out, or use the DMR and, and, and explore it on your own. OK, MySQL utilities. 
Biosphere Utilities, uh, again, uh, is designed to automate a lot of the common development or operations tasks, particularly with replication, provisioning slaves, for example, testing, monitoring, and of course, failover. You can also do administrative things like database consistency checking. We have a database consistency checker that is designed to not just master and slave, but any two databases any, that you want to have on different servers, that you want to compare them and find out what's different. Well, there are a lot of database consistency checkers out there. This one does something unique. It provides you a difference between the two. So if you want to be able to determine if the two databases on two different servers are the same or not, and if they're not, how do I transform them so that they are the same? The MySQL DB Compare utility will allow you to generate those transformation statements. So the alter table, the insert, the updates, all those SQL statements will be generated for you automatically. That's very handy. Now that's something that, that takes some time to run. It's not designed to be a tool that you run constantly and it tells you, bing, your data is different. Now this is an off, offline kind of tool. Offline in this case meaning it's going to issue a table lock when it does its calculations. So it's a tool that you might want to run during your normal uh, offline uh, stuff like between midnight and 5 a.m. kind of thing. But if you want to make sure you want to do consistent checking, you can use that. We also have tools for uh, administrating users. So right now with MySQL, one of the, the pains, if you will, for DBAs is if I have a user and I have a complicated set of grants, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten, maybe a dozen grants that I need to issue for that user, and I need to create 100 users just like it, how do you do that? Got a utility for that called MySQL User Clone. Allows you to take a user and copy its grants to another server, as many other users as you want. So that's pretty handy. Uh, Again, there are things for tables, there are things for log analysis that we have in the works, and so on. But the really cool thing about the utilities is that they're all written in Python. They are a plugin for MySQL Workbench. So if you, get, if you download MySQL Workbench versions 5.2.32 or later, 3.2 or 2.9, oh, the latest one has all of the MySQL utilities. Um, that means if you're a Python developer, you can extend the utility to do whatever you want. And I have another talk about MySQL utilities where I demonstrate how you can mash up several utilities together very easily because of the way utilities are written. It's written in a tiered environment so that the command itself is a, a module. So like copy user is a module. Uh, copy database is a module. Create a new instance of a server is a module. So if you want to create a new instance of a server, copy the databases, copy the user, set up replication, you can mash those four together and make one, one utility yourself. Or you can run four utilities individually. Uh, how you get it, again, it's part of Workbench, but you can also look at the, the manual we have out there on Dev MySQL, and there's also a forms list for it, forms number 155. And MySQL utilities is available on Launchpad as well. I have a slide with that information. So here's some workflow information for using MySQL utilities with replication. We have a check stage, a replicate stage, a show stage, and a failover and admin. So check, you want to verify the prerequisites for replication. Uh, rep, REPL stage, you want to actually initiate the replication. Show, you want to show the replication, how it is set up. So if you want to know, yeah, again, a master with lots of slaves or, or tiered, where you have a, a, a top level master and several tiers below it, and you want to see the entire topology, as long as you start with the topmost master and tell it to recurse, it will draw a map of your entire topology. You'll find out what the, the host names and ports are for every slave in the topology. Failover and administration, talk briefly about those, and I'll show you some uh, examples in a moment. All right, the first one, MySQL RPL check. What this does is test a master and a slave to see if it's configured properly. Believe it or not, you can start replication in such a way that it's maybe not entirely the best way to set it up. In fact, it might even work. But this particular utility is designed to use the standard, our best practices, to test the master and slave and see if they're set up properly. 
Now this might be handy, again, in a situation where you have a lot of masters and many, many slaves, to know, uh, is this really slave really a, you know, a slave of that master? Well, you can run REPL check, and it will tell you whether it is or not. Or if you have a slave that's been disconnected, you can use REPL check to, to determine whether it's the right slave or not. So among the things it does is make sure the bin log is enabled on the master and displays any bin log exceptions. Anybody use bin log exceptions? No? Yeah? Okay. On the master or slave? Okay. This will show you both. So that's good. Um, and briefly, uh, bin log exceptions allow you to put filters on the master and filters on the slave, so, or both in this case. So if there are databases on the master that you don't want to replicate, you can on the master say, do not include these. If there are uh, databases that you want to replicate so that you have the possibility of duplicating them, but maybe for a certain subset of slaves, you don't actually want to update the information there. So maybe you have some, uh, and I have a slide on this, where you segregate your slaves for different applications. You can use filtering on the slaves to only process those events for certain databases. So it's pretty nice. Um, so here's an example of Ripple Check running. It runs as a series of tests, and it'll give you a pass or fail. And all the utilities are designed so that if you tell it to use verbosity or simply dash VVV, it allows you to put, or you can do dash s verbosity, dash s verbosity, and so on. But dash VVV is shorter. Uh, it will show you more information. So in this case, it will actually show you the binary log name and position on the master, show you the exceptions, and so on and so forth. The replicate utility is the utility you would use to actually set up replication between a master and slave. And this is very nice because it's been, been changed to support the 5.6 DMR. So if you use global transaction IDs, your change master command is just slightly different. You don't have to provide the binary log and position anymore. You simply tell it that, that you're using global transaction IDs. But this, again, the replicate will do that for you. You can provide the login connection parameters for the master. It does not currently support SSL. Anybody use replication use SSL? I, mean, I haven't found too many people that use that. But if you want it, we can add it. I just didn't include it in the first release of this. Uh, it also checks uh, the starting points to make sure everything is cool. So you can tell it to set up replication in master and slave and start at the beginning. In other words, request everything from the master and process it. That might be handy if the master is not you know, that far ahead. But if the master is months ahead, that might take you a while to run. But you could do it. You can also tell it to start a particular bin log file in position. Or you can tell it to start at the current bin log file position. So different ways that you can use that is pretty handy depending on your scenario that you're working in. Depends on, yeah, it depends on which one you do. If you if you copy the data yourself, then you would probably use the one where you provide the 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 time, yeah, the the point in time recovery information, the bin log file and position at the time of your backup. No, it depends on which one you do. If you do start from the beginning, it will it will suck in all everything from the master. That's not copying the data, that's processing all the events. Yeah, yeah, it could take a while. In that case, you'd want to do the copy first. Yeah, yeah. And we have a utility for that, MySQL DB copy. So you can copy the databases at a time. Um, the other thing it does is it checks storage engine compatibility. That's not such a big deal in 5.5 and 5.6, but there for a while in 5.0, 5.1 to 5.5, it, depending on which version you use, it used a different default storage engine. And depending on which one you use, it had a different InnoDB storage engine. This will check that for you. So if you have particularly 5.1 servers, or you're, some of them have the InnoDB plugin, some have InnoDB compiled, uh, those two aren't necessarily compatible. And this will actually tell you that, whether it is or not. Uh, it also check to see that your servers have the correct storage engine. So in this case, the slave needs to have the same storage engines as the master. It's OK if it has more, but it has to have that minimal set from the master. Here's an example of it running. It's very simple. It doesn't do a whole lot. It just sets up replication for you. You can tell it to test the replication. There's a feature you call it dash dash test, and it will actually test. It'll 
create a table, put a row in it, and make sure it shows up on the sleigh. So if you really want to make sure that it's, everything's cool. RPL show is that when I told you it will create a map of your topology, in this case, as long as you provide the topmost master, you can tell it to recurse, and it will show you the host name and port of everyone in there. It will also detect circular replication. So that's pretty handy. Oh. And uh, this, is, this actually turned out to be more useful than I thought. There's a lot of people are starting, when they use utilities, they're using this to verify their topology. So if they're, like, if the, they need to do a switch over, so they switch the role of master, then they run this and look at their topology, because it's not easier. It's, I mean, it makes more sense. So it's pretty handy to us. One of those things we wrote, ah, oh, this would be cool, then we realized it's much more valuable than that. Okay, let's talk about the MySQL failover utility. I'm sorry? I certainly can. Slave plus master? That's telling you that that is the next tier. So it's a slave of, in this case, localhost at port 3306, but it's also a master to localhost 3313. Yeah, it's a slave here. I'll use the pointer. This one is a slave of that. And this is a slave of that. Pretty cool. And if there were a circular repli uh, replication, it would actually note that as well. OK, uh, again, the failover utility. If the master fails, Again, this is only available for 5.6. It will do automatic failover for you. You can tell it which slaves that you want to be the, what we're calling the candidate slaves. So you, when you start MySQL failover, you can say, I want only these slaves to be the new master. So in, in this case, you're talking about a slave that probably has the same kind of hardware as the master. In other words, it could, could, it could run as fast as your master. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Some installations use less powerful machines for their slaves, particularly when they, they do a, a large scale out, that, because they don't need to be quite as powerful as the master. And in that case, you definitely want to isolate your candidate slaves to that list. And there are three ways of doing that. You can tell failover to automatically switch over, give it a list of candidates, and if none of those candidates are viable, let's say a whole rack of your, your server room went down, so it can't get to any of those slaves, it will actually start looking at the rest of the slaves in the topology. So eventually we'll find one, or if it runs out of slaves, it will fail. Okay, that's catastrophic, but it could happen. That's called automatic failover. If you want to be more restrictive and say, okay, with failover occurs, I only want it to fail over to one of my candidate slaves, that's called slave election. So you tell it to elect. It will only look at the candidate slaves and will ignore the rest. Or the, the trivial one where you tell it, if everything fails, just stop, fail. Don't actually fail over. Uh, so that's handy if you just want to do reporting. Uh, you can, as this bullet says, you can bind your own pre and post failover scripts. There are actually four places right, bef right as failover occurs. So currently, the failover detection is, can I ping the master? Yes. Can I connect to it? Yes. Then the master is OK. If any one of those fail, then the master is down. It actually does it in reverse. It says, can I execute a query against the master? Yes, the query executes, then it must be up, right? If I can't execute the query, can I ping it? If I can ping it, then it still must be up. Don't fail over yet, because that may just be a, a latency issue. Okay. But if you have something more complicated, your own in, in, peculiar, specialized, let's say, process of detecting whether the master is down or not, based on your demand, based on your need for availability, you can specify a script that returns a 0 or a 1, an integer, where a 0 is don't fail over, 1 says fail over. So you can tell it whether to fail over or not, based on your own script, detecting whether the master is up or not. You can also execute a script right before failover. So it's the failover detection right before failover, right after failover, before the slaves were set to the new master, and then at the end, after all the slaves have been pointed to the, ma to the new master. All those are scripts that you can, can uh, set up to communicate 
from the MySQL failover to your own scripts or your own application. Now, in a future, we have a feature request in. But right now, it just executes the scripts, with the exception of the failover one, where it gets the return code back. In future, we're going to start passing information to those scripts, like the name of the new master. That might be handy if you need to do IP failover. Exactly. Exactly. That's coming. That's a feature request. That's, I can tell you that because it's in our system. <laughs> uh, but that, that is coming. So that's pretty nice. So uh, a virtual IP failover, that kind of thing, you can uh, create a, a script, and it, that's typically how that's done, to where you can point your application to the new IP. Or if you use the same host name, but you, you know, uh, change the IP kind of thing, you know, multi homes or whatever, you can do that as well. Purely uh, application specific in that realm. So here's an example of MySQL failover running. Part of its duty is to look at the master and its slave and report the health of those master and slaves. So that's what you see there in that big, well, it looks like a query return, but that big uh, graph there. And so on each interval, and that's how long a time it waits to check the master, it will produce the health report of your master and its slave. So if you have this on a console somewhere where you can look at it occasionally, you can tell whether one of the slaves are down or not. Um, and also after failover, you can tell, the, you can look at it and see the new topology. Uh, the other features are you can tell it to refresh at any time. And if you turn the logging on for this utility, you can actually look at the log as well. You can also look at the global transaction ID list. So you can see the global transaction identifiers that are used in the topology as well. Yes, sir. Oh, no. <laughs> Think GUID. <laughs> yeah, it's a GUID. <laughs> Very large, big, ugly number. Yeah, yeah. What's the health status? What does it mean? Oh, a, a variety of things. For the master, is whether the master is online or not. For a slave, whether it is online and connected to the master, it doesn't have any errors, and the I.O. thread is still working, and the SQL thread is still working, and so on and so forth. Now, as I mentioned earlier with verbosity, you can turn verbosity on on this. And right now, it gives you this monster list of things that it checks. So you can see everything it checks if you use verbosity. So let's see what happens when the master fails. When the master fails, the console will say, oh, hey, your master's failed. I'm starting failover. And actually step through all of the steps. So you can see them there, where it says, OK, I'm looking for a candidate slave. So it starts with the first one. Ah, I found one. It tells you, this is, will be the new master. And it prepares the candidate for failover. That's that process where I told you it takes the candidate and makes it a slave of every other slave. So it accumulates all the transactions in play. Then we create the replication user, if it's not already created or not. Stop all the slaves. Say, well, don't stop doing everything. Then switch the slaves to the new master. Start the slaves. Check them from errors. And that failover is done. And then we discover slaves. If you have discovery set on, oh, that's another option for failover. You can tell it, you can specify your slaves, or you can tell it to discover the slaves on the topology. And the, the way the discovery works, it requires that you have report host and report port set for your slaves. If you don't do that, it can't discover the slaves. And then, of course, monitoring resumes, and now you see the new topology in the health report. The replication administration utility, on the other hand, will do switchover or failover on demand. So there's one nice thing about switchover. If you have a situation where you have a master and several slaves, and you simply want to move the role of master from one from the master to one of the slaves, but you don't want the slave to go offline, you can tell it to demote the master. So when you're done, if you have four systems in your topology, one master to three slaves, at the switchover, you still have one master and three slaves. That would be handy. Yes, sir. You can make the old master a slave, and you still have the original slaves that you had. Is that, was that your question? No, assume that the master slave died. Oh, OK, failover then. OK. OK. So which one of the slaves is going to initiate the master? Well, in this case, it's on demand, so you get to choose. Assume that you can forget one slave Okay. Let me give you a different slave. The master did not die. 
Yes. Right. Well, if you run this particular utility, it'll do exactly what you tell it to. If you tell it to fail over to a particular slave, it will do the failover to that slave. Uh, if you run the the other utility, MySQL failover, if it, if a slave uses connectivity to the master, it'll simply re report that in the health. It's the MySQL failover is monitoring the master, not the slaves. It'll report the health of the slaves, but it's monitoring the master. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Oh. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, check, talk with me afterwards and we'll, we'll walk through it in a little more detail. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think so, but let's talk about it afterwards, and that way I'll get you a, a more specific answer. Uh, now, switchover in this case works for 5.5, 5.1, 5.0. .5 so switchover will work uh, outside of 5.6. Failover only works for 5.6 because failover requires global transaction IDs. So here's an example of MySQL RPL admin running uh, to do switchover in this case. And I know it's switchover because the command says switchover. <laughs> uh, and also there's an example of how you would do the demote master. And there's an example of how you would list the slaves in a topology. You simply use, use a comma separated list. No spaces <laughs> and set up that, that way. Uh, another nice thing about MySQL RPL admin is that if you want to do failover manually yourself, but you don't know which slave is the best candidate, you can tell it to run that, that procedure to determine which slave is the best candidate. And in a perfect world, the answer is all of them are. But um, there may be a case where a slave has lost connectivity to the master, which would not make it a, a good candidate. Now, how to get utilities. Again, it is part of Workbench, but you can also get it off of Launchpad. And here are the URLs to get it off of Launchpad. But if you get it from Launchpad, you're also going to need the connector Python. So MySQL provide, uh, Oracle provides several connectors for MySQL, including C++, PHP, Java, ODBC, and now Python connector. And that's also available on Launchpad. And there's a link to the documentation. Okay. Now let's talk about MySQL cluster. A MySQL cluster is our, an extremely scalable a high availability and, of course, affordability, depending on how you look at it, um, solution. And here are some uh, customers that use MySQL Cluster. It's for high volume online transaction processing, e-commerce, uh, user profile management type things, session management and caching, think cell phones, uh, content management, even online gaming. Uh, I don't know if it's still around or not, but Linbit, not Linbit, uh, What's that online virtual reality? Second Life. Second Life, Life uses MySQL cluster. And then the telecom industry uses MySQL cluster a lot. Some of the key benefits, uh, you can scale reads and writes. So unlike replication where you typically scale reads, you can do both in this case. Uh, there's auto sharding as well as multi-master. It is transactional, which is really cool. Um, it is designed purposely for 5.9 uptime. So it's a shared nothing design, no single point of failure. Any node in the cluster could fail and it still operates. That's pretty, pretty nice. Very, very tolerant. Real-time responsiveness, it's an in-memory database. So uh, it is designed for high performance and low latency. It has both an SQL through MySQL and no SQL APIs. It's always had no SQL uh, access. And of course, uh, it's low uh, total cost ownership as well. So here's an example of architecture. So let's say you have your application nodes at the top. You have your, the in red box there, that's your cluster. You have one, two nodes there. And the data nodes are replicating all the data. If something happens really bad, like everything goes away except one MySQL server, you can still access all the data. 
pretty neat. Schedule maintenance is very easy. You can uh, scale the cluster very quickly. You can repartition tables on the, on the fly. Yes, yes, on the fly. Upgrade and patch the servers, do backup, and do schema changes as well, all in real time. So here are some uh, highlights of MySQL cluster 7.2, a next release. It is much higher performance um, and a number of features there. And uh, it is, a, of course, the fastest growing release of cluster yet. So there are two more things to consider. Oracle, this is an enterprise solution, so this is a, a, a pay for service. Oracle VM template for MySQL provides a fully integrated Linux uh, in a virtual environment with the uh, Oracle cluster file system set up. Everything set up. It's a, a fully packaged system available for, for you to use MySQL in a high availability solution. So if you're interested in that, you can see me, and we have a number of guys here that can talk more about that. And there's an example of the white paper at the bottom. Also, for Windows, any Windows, you know, I hesitate to ask that in a Linux conference, but if you're using Windows, you can have Windows Server failover clustering as well. That's another product that we have. We have one? Woo! Okay. Then this slide is for you. Uh, so you can use Windows Server there to, to have a cluster and uh, be able to use MySQL also in a high availability solution for Windows. It's very nice. There is a guide. It's a little hard to read, but you can see me afterwards. I'll make sure you get the slides so you can look at that in a little more detail. Also, Solaris clustering. So if you use Solaris and you want to use Solaris cluster with MySQL, we have a solution for that as well. Okay, any questions? All right, you've been a great audience. Thank you. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You'll have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. 
Wellstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.